This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have turned the calendar to November, which means we've got some impactful football coming up here in the very near future. But a lot of those games, the important games, not on this week's slate. We got a lot of weird games and try to pick out the three most important games this week was a difficult task. But I think they're interesting, even if they're not like the highest profile matchup. Still pretty interesting games. We're going to break down those with Ryan Williams getting his read on those games and his favorite bets across week nine over at FanDuel Sportsbook. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here once again by Ryan Williams. Check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Ryan, we're on to week number nine. Halloween decorations going in the, in the box. <laughs> Thanksgiving one's coming out here pretty soon. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great, Jim. I'm doing great. We got week nine here. I uh, can't believe how fast the season is flying by, but you know, we we get a couple more weeks here to to make ends meet, as they say. So we're just trying to push forward and, and get the best number on the lines and get action for people uh, that they can be confident in. And I'm sure that you were pretty sad to put away your Halloween decorations, given that you had the Amari Cooper anytime touchdown, the Tyler Boyd anytime touchdown. You had the Donovan <laughs> Peoples Jones yardage. So uh, Halloween, a good night for Ryan. We'll see if November can be just as kind to him as well. We'll break down week number nine here and trade implications in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Our college football week number 10 preview podcast is up on the feed and up on the FanDuel YouTube page. We talked about this week's biggest games including tennessee versus georgia with ben brown of pro football focus along with of course dr ed feng got their read on those games and other bets they like this week and also we'll have jj zacharyson on tomorrow to break down player props for week nine in the nfl to get those as they are posted make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts twisted t and fandle have joined forces to bring you a one-of-a-kind contest series that gives you a chance to compete for your share of thousands of dollars in psych credit. Introducing Twisted T's College Football Picks, a sports betting focused contest series that's entirely free to play. The contest is simple. Each college football game will be assigned money line, spread, and total markets with assigned points to each market. All you have to do is make six selections based on those three markets and earn points for each correct selection you made. If at the end of the day, your score ranks among the best in the contest, you'll be eligible for your share of site credit. Head to FanDuel.com slash Twisted T picks and make your picks. And remember, please drink responsibly. Let's turn the page now towards week number nine and begin things with the trade deadline from Tuesday because, Ryan, we saw 10 trades, a new record for the number of trades at the trade deadline. And... I think when I'm updating my numbers, every trade is going to be like have marginal issue. It's going to have like Mm -hmm. a marginal effect on those teams. And it might not necessarily have a huge effect. But I did want to ask you at least to get your read on this. Were there any trades we saw Tuesday that actually tangibly impacted your view of a team from a futures market perspective? No, not not really, um, yeah. which feels weird because it was such an exciting day. Um, and I think that the you know, I think there's some trades that have a lot of implications maybe going forward as we look at the 2023 season. For right. example, let's talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars. How yeah. are you guys going to finish out your season? What draft pick are you getting? You get Calvin Ridley back next year uh, for a full year if he's able to, you know, get into OTAs and training camp in a full season after missing one. Um, so we could really be looking at that offense in a different light. Um, the Bears, you know, bringing in Claypool, I think that shows that they invest in the offense a little bit. Now we're looking at them having a high pick, I, you know, uh, the elephant in the room is that they'll be drafting a receiver, um, possibly another Ohio State guy to go along with Justin Fields there. And then you're looking at, you know, rookie receiver with Claypool, with Darnell Mooney, um, possibly some other moves there, and hopefully they boost up the line. So I think a lot of these things kind of set teams up for the future. You know, if we got a move like Christian McCaffrey on trade deadline day, you know, that would be huge for the 49ers, but we already saw that kind of happen. So we're really looking for like those stars or anything. It really, you know, was disappointing to see teams um, like the Rams and uh, the, uh, the Rams and uh, the Packers not do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because like, you know what the Rams need, they need juice and they didn't get any juice on at the trade deadline. So that was disappointment, but I did want to talk to you about your bears because they did make that Claypool trade and 
I thought that was pretty interesting. And like the compensation is, you know, we can talk about that. But I think the the more the bigger takeaway for me is I took it as being an endorsement of Justin Fields saying that we're going to give this guy a shot. And I thought that that was my biggest takeaway from that trade was that they want to at least give him the pieces to be successful, potentially, you know, give him a shot at that. Do you have a similar read on the Claypool trade where it was kind of saying, hey, Justin, go prove to us you deserve to be our long term quarterback? Sorry, I realized that was on mute there. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think that, I think I think that was the that, I think that was the case you've seen with Luke Getzey getting him involved in a little bit um, of them going through the motions of just letting him run more, a little bit more RPO. So I thought David Montgomery might be moved. Um, yeah. So it was it was it was good to see them make this move here. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, let's turn our focus towards week number nine in the NFL here and start things off with the Bills at the Jets. The Bills are 12 and a half point favorites. Total for this game is at 46 and a half. And this is, I know it's a big total or a big spread, I should say, but this game is actually important because we've seen the Jets struggle at times, but they're still a game and a half out in the AFC East behind the Bills. So this game actually does matter. And I feel like the Bills actually have to like care about this game. So I got to ask you, Ryan, can the Jets keep this one close and potentially cover a large spread? Or is it just it's just Buffalo's world and we're all trying to trying to live in it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is Buffalo's world and we're all trying to live in it. And, you, you know, it, this would be a little bit different for me, I think, had Josh Allen kind of gone out um, last week and just really, you know, blown blow the doors off there um, in that matchup against Green Bay on Sunday night. But you look at him struggle, um, you look at his history against the Jets, very successful there, but it's still a 13 number, right, with the 12 and a half being the line there, uh, which doesn't make you feel good about it. I think if I had a lean in this game, I would really be looking at the under uh, mm-hmm. Because I just don't know how the Jets, you know, finish drives and get points out, out here. I mean, the pressure rate for Buffalo is strong. Uh, Zach Wilson absolutely um, is terrible <laughs> with, uh, with when he faces pressure. Um, so if you're looking at, you know, the Jets maybe getting, you know, 10, 13 points here. Um, and even even if the Buffalo Bills are able to score 30, um, you're still looking at the under here on that number. And that's kind of the lean that I would have here. It make, you know, road road divisional opponent uh, with the road team being favored by double digits doesn't make you feel good. But again, it is Josh Allen and he's always able to kind of make things happen. Zach Wilson doesn't give you merit on the other side. But I do think this defense uh, for the Jets is solid. And if they can yeah. kind of just hold things, hold things pat, maybe it keeps it a little bit more of a competitive game. Get Getting um, Zach Wilson short fields and maybe they're kicking field goals to kind of help keep that number down. And I think you touched on the key thing there where Buffalo is one of the best teams in the league, potentially the best team in the league, generating pressure without blitzing, because that means they don't need to dedicate resources to blitzing Zach Wilson to generate pressure. And as you mentioned, he I think last week, I think he was like one of 14, like completing passes while under pressure, which is not ideal. Um, completion yeah, percentage is a very ideal. flawed stat, but that's not great. Um he had some good throws in that game, but if he's if he's under pressure, you know, we've seen that he's not quite there yet to, to handle that. And so when I look at my numbers, my numbers, both my traditional model and my 2022 only model say to bet the Jets. I can't get there. I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. Um, it's like the Nick Saban thing. I'm not gonna. So quit asking. I, that's me <laughs> right now with this Jets game because big numbers have the potential to get out of hand. And so even though I've got the Jets as like eight and a half point underdogs in this game, you think about the path to that. Like, let's say they get down 10 early. They're in a negative game script the entire game. So they could, you know, over whatever the average number, the average loss could wind up being eight and a half points, but it's about the median and the median is probably going to be bigger than 12 and a half. So to me, yeah. I think I'd rather stay away from this game. Uh, just ignore it entirely. I think that uh, the under makes sense given, like, I agree with you. The Jets defense is pretty good. They've got playmakers uh, there and they've got a good defensive line that could potentially give some issues to this Buffalo offense line, which is not the strength right. of their team. So I think I agree with what you're saying there, where if I were to, I have not bet this game. I will not bet this game. I refuse to, but uh, if I were to, I think the under would be the way to go here at 46 and a half. Absolutely. And just two quick things there off of that is, you know, the Buffalo side of things when we are betting, you know, a a double digit favorite here, we love Buffalo because they 
put the foot on the throat, they do not Absolutely. let up. And especially with this being a divisional opponent, I imagine we'd see some of the same. So that kind of licks me weary. But again, on the Jets side, you know, with the defense, and we've seen Buffalo in the past, you know, in these spots where they are just favored heavily, um, you know, they they sometimes can lay an egg or just not look as explosive. I think that because things were so easy for them against Green Bay and Josh Allen was the reason for the struggles, I think he could bounce back here in a way. But as I say all that just to say that's even more reason why it's a stay away line for me. Yeah, I very much agree. So let's move on here to the Chargers at the Falcons. The Chargers three point favorites here. Total is 49 and a half. And the Falcons defense, like we talk a lot about Detroit's defense. Um, the Falcons defense is in the same tier as them as far as being hideous. So like we should probably yeah. highlight that. And like, that's a good situation yeah. for the chargers, but the chargers offense is maddening and they're super banged up. Um, Mike Williams will not play. Keenan Allen didn't practice Wednesday. And I think he's probably going to sit based on what he was saying on Wednesday. So it's a beat up offense against a dog do defense. How do you see this game playing out? Yeah. I mean, we love it. The Atlanta cover Falcons, um, they, Nobody. you know, Let's getting go. three, three at home. And he, I've talked about the chargers at nauseum uh, on the show with you, Jim, uh, how they were my Super Bowl favorite and how invested I am in them. And even if I think, you know, it, more so getting the three points here because the chargers are a team that every, every time they are, are in games like this, it's a one score game. It comes down to the last possession there. So that kind of what, lets me lean on the Atlanta Falcons, you know, plus three, because it could be a situation where the Atlanta Falcons are, you know, able to kind of, you know, maybe they lose, but they kick a field goal and they cut it down and it's a two or one point game, uh, something weird like that. But like you said, the Chargers defense banged up the offense is, you know, they're going to be throwing out Josh Palmer and Gerald Everett. Now I will say those weapons with the secondary for Atlanta, and I'm not sure what the injury report's shaping in at, but they were they were banged up last week. And so if guys like AJ Terrell and other guys in the secondary can't go, you know, Herbert is the guy who can, you know, they'll get Eckler involved. He'll find Josh Palmer. He'll find Gerald Everett. Um, he'll find other guys on the roster. Like, he's not one to just marry to Mike Williams and Keenan <laughs> Allen, and that's it. So that's kind of what would make you feel a little bit good about the Chargers line here, um, but they've just looked like such a shell, a shell of themselves. And you can tell that, you know, if they're not able to make something happen in this game, we could start seeing them, you know, just try and wrap the season up early and get healthy for next year. Yeah, I know we had we talked on a couple weeks ago about the Seahawks Cardinals game, and I t told you like how relieved I was to bet against the Cardinals. It was like such a, a good feeling. I feel that way betting against the Chargers this week because like I've mentioned before that I built my like alternate model, my 2022 only model, because I thought my other model was too high on the Chargers. I was annoyed with it because they had this stupid offense where they run this like stupid, stupid, stupid early down offense and then rely on Justin Herbert to, to bail them out on third and fourth down. I hate that. Uh, it's not sustainable. Yeah. And so I built this other model. The other model telling me to bet the Falcons, whatever. I get that. Like, you know, it's going to do that. It's tailored to, like, punish this team for being dumb. But my 20, my, like, traditional model, my, like, the model that, like, should be high on the Chargers, uh, was very high on them preseason, as you were, as you mentioned. That one also says to bet the Falcons. So if I have the 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 model that like loves the chargers and i specifically am trying to get away from for 2023 because it was too high in the chargers if that one says to bet against the chargers i'm taking the falcons money line baby it's plus 140 there was a moment yesterday where when the keenan allen uh missed practice news came out the falcons money line went to 146 i was like hold on like i've like what are we doing here like i've I have not had great success this year when I've gotten good closing line value. So I'm not like, you know, it's, it's, I'm not like sweating the fact that it hasn't moved in my favor yet, but like, don't move against me, please. It did go back to 140 overnight. So that's good. I feel a bit better about that, but I, I think the Falcons are the right side here. Um, it's just fun to bet against the Chargers right now, which means that Justin Herbert's going to do some Justin Herbert stuff and make me regret my words. But you know what? Until Sunday, I'm going to feel good about it. And uh, we're going to bet against the Chargers here and see what happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm riding with you, Jim. So everything that you said uh, just makes me uh, more confident in in the bet here in Atlanta. It's just, you know, and, and shout out to Arthur Smith and everything that they've done this year with the regime, because people counted this team out like yeah. it was nothing. And now they're playing for possibly a win at the NFC South. So, you know, good kudos to them.
We are all in on a team that has Marcus Mariota quarterback and refuse to throw. What yeah. could go wrong? Let's finish up here with the Rams at the Bucks. Bucks now three point favorites. Total is 42 and a half. And both these offenses have um, underwhelmed quite a bit so far this year. So we got the disappointment bowl coming up on Sunday, Ryan. Who you got winning this one? I'm, I'm going to the Bucks here. I'm um, going to the Bucks at Raymond James. They're they're getting three here. Uh, talk about broken offenses. This Rams offense is just absolutely a shell of itself. And like I said, I you know tried to warn people who were high on Matt, Matthew Stafford this year coming into the season. Best ball, like the, the surgery, the you know the way that the offense was kind of shaping up. No help outside of Cooper Cup. You know, I, I, Allen Robinson was there, but you know we've seen him here in Chicago, and it yeah. just really didn't look the same. And that is kind of you know come to fruition here in this season and the backfield is an absolute mess um like i said i was very shocked that they didn't make a move here um at the running back position we know that they tried to go out for christian mccaffrey they were there were talks about them getting naheem hines things of that nature cam cam Akers, does he get moved does he not he's still on the team McVay, of course in trolling fashion talking about he could suit up for uh sunday after all the cryptic tweets and everything that's going on they're just a disaster and i mean what better you know disaster on for the Bucks on the other side who have been dealing with their own issues with the Tom Brady news coming out. And I think that that probably might be a weight off of the shoulder, right? Like that probably was the elephant in the room. I'm going to use that phrase again for the second time on the show. But like now that that's just out there in the open yeah. and that's not, <laughs> you know, a secret that everybody has to keep on the team and everything like that, they can just focus on football. I mean, this is like Brady's time to shine, right? You're looking at them to win the division there. They're only uh, minus 135. Um, which is yeah. kind of crazy to win the division. They are obviously on paper the much better team than the other three op opponents that they have in that division. So I think this is a huge spot for them to kind of show everybody that, you know, hey, we're still, you know, we're halfway through the season. We still have a chance to not only win our division, but when we get into the playoffs, we're going to make noise and do that on a stage where they're going against a Rams team that, you know, is littered with weapons, uh, regardless of how they feel about them. I still think that will sway the public's perception um, very vastly if the Bucks are able to pull this one out. So are we saying that the Tinder Tom narrative is now a positive that <laughs> the divorce news is public? Are we saying that the, the Tinder Tom narrative has gone from being a negative slash distraction to being a positive for Tinder Tom? Absolutely. I mean, okay. now because now it's finalized. So now yeah. it's not like, oh, is there a potential that they could, you know, rectify things or whatever? Like, no, it's just Brady going out there and he's in the and, streets. <laughs> yeah, right. He's he's in these streets. And you know what? The team has to come along with him. And I will be curious to see how this offensive line plays against the front seven there for the Rams. But, you know, they've been in positions where, listen, Chris Godwin being healthy, Mike Evans, you, you know, let's not have duck hands. Let's try and catch the football here. And, and some things can kind of break their way. Right. And so I think that especially with that home crowd behind them and just rallying behind this team, this is a perfect spot for them to kind of do that. And they're only, you know, the three you talking about it being a close game, go down there, kick a field goal from suck up. I, I like this spot. I've been monitoring this line all week because I've interest in the bucks. And I, there was a moment where it got to two and a half on uh, Wednesday. It was two and a half, but it was minus 120 on that. It is now back to three. It's a minus 104. So you're getting a little bit of a compensation for um, getting the push at three. But I think that I've heard to go the money line here. Uh, the Bucks money line is minus 146. And I think I'm just going to go with that. I, I honestly feel like I was trying to wait out this market, see where it would wind up going. But I think it's pretty steady at minus 146. Cooper Cup didn't practice Wednesday. He's still going to play, I would guess. But to me, his not practicing is an indication that that ankle injury is not nothing. Right. So I think that the Bucks are the right side here. I prefer the money line at minus 146 to get me that extra safety. But I, I agree. Uh, we are riding Tinder, Tom. Thankfully, it's not Sleepy Tom narrative this week because it is an afternoon <laughs> game, not a night game. So we have only... Beautiful. One narrative at play here, the Tinder Tom narrative, and it's now positive per Ryan. So I'm going to go with the Bucks money line at minus 146. All right, let's open up the board here for you on week number nine, Ryan. What else you seeing at FanDuel that you like for this week? Yeah, so let's stick in the three o'clock slot there. Um, I'm I'm going back to to the Seahawks. Well, we've yeah, talked maybe. about this team too. Uh, they're getting plus two betting them against uh, Arizona. Um, the road and home splits for Arizona oppo of what you would normally think. They they somehow are better on the road uh, than they are, than they are at covering at home. Um, and Geno Smith is just he he's just been that dude this season. Um, being able to carry this team, we love that. Kenneth Walker um, could get more involved here, and the defense is really you know kind of short short up themselves as well so uh you know the the arizona side on on the other side 
we don't we don't know what to expect, right? I mean, the offense has had pieces kind of rotating in. Haven't seen James Conner in a couple of weeks. Could be Eno Benjamin once again. Um, but they just, you know, they they find themselves in these spots, and they, I don't know how we can trust them to be giving points in in any type of scenario at this point. So I'll just take the two with Seattle um, and let that one ride out. And then when we go into the noon games. I am uh I am interested in uh two other games in the NFC North. So the Detroit Lions getting three and a half. I mean, they have not been able to cover for a while. They look broken with Jared Goff. Uh, but so does this Packers team. And I mean, the one thing that you can do is establish the run. And we know that Deuce Staley and and the rest of the Lions uh coaching staff will just get it doesn't matter if Swift or Jamal Williams is out there, they're just going to run the ball as much as they can against Green Bay, probably keep Aaron Rodgers off the field. Um, we you know, don't know Lazard's status at this point, but the wide receivers, you know, I mean, they're relying on Dobbs and Toure um, to kind of carry things for Aaron there. Um, they possibly could get Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon a little bit more involved, but this is an offense, too, that is broken, and we'll see. Like, Aaron Rodgers has been publicly, um, you know, dragging them through the mud uh, for not getting them any help, and this is the first game after the trade deadline where, you know, we could see him be sour grapes if this game is going sideways, so I'll take the three and a half there, and also with the Vikings uh, game and the Commanders, too, I want to see the status of Chase Young. Um, If Chase Young, I saw he was practicing I don't know if that was limited fashion or full, but Chase Young being back, I think, helps this defense tremendously. Um, And I know that people are going to lean on the Vikings. They just made that huge trade for TJ Hawkinson. And obviously we know all of the weapons that they have there, but this is a road game for them. Um, And, you know, kind of trusting on Kirk Cousins. Uh, Heineke has looked like he's got control of this offense. We love that Scary Terry's been a little bit more involved. Antonio Gibson has been risen from the dead by Ron Rivera and company. So um, I'd be interested in that with the Chase Young status, um, getting more info on that. But yeah, those are my leans for week nine as, as it stands right now. Yeah, Chase Young designated to return on Wednesday, which means he did practice for the first time Wednesday. He They would be announcing that on Saturday. I think the positive for the commander side, if you like that, is that you're probably not going to see a shift based on Young being activated. So you can probably hold out and yep. wait until Saturday or Sunday morning to get that number. It's three and a half right now uh, in favor of the Vikings. So if you want the commanders plus three and a half, monitor Chase Young's status, see where he's at. Could potentially get that later on. Going back to Seattle, my numbers agree with you. Um, they have uh, the Cardinals. My traditional one has the Cardinals favored by 0.9 points. But my 2022 only model, not surprisingly, has Seattle favored despite being on the road by 1.7 points. So uh, I, I'm fine with Geno Smith uh, riding it once again. Honestly, at this point, why would we not <laughs> trust Geno? So I think why that uh, I'm on board with those as well. That is all that we got here for week number nine in the NFL. But we do have our player prop episode coming up for tomorrow with JJ Zacharias. And get that by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and a review as well. Ryan, I, I want to thank you once again, as always. Good luck to you this week. We'll talk to you once again Monday to break down the Ravens at the Saints. Sounds good. I can't wait. We got to start off November strong for everybody. So uh, thanks for everybody tuning in and we'll catch you next time. Looking forward to it. You can find Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to wrap up week nine. We're talking about some player props. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 